Good morning and welcome to Bears Grove on Christmas morning. How's everybody doing? All right, Merry Christmas to everybody. It's good to see you. This is a great way to spend Christmas morning, amen? Let's stand and sing joy to the world, Christ alone. true the last line of that song is the joy of the world is christ alone amen absolutely we'll continue with a medley of christmas hymns so if you join us oh come all you faithful
Good to see you all here today. You know, we were kind of joking when the praise team was warming up, said, how many think will be here besides us? I said, I don't know, but y'all turned out good. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. I'm assuming some of you may be waiting until after the service to open gifts with your families. But if you got young children, that's not an option, right? It's not an option. You know, I remember when I was a little kid, I would bug my mom and dad and my older sister until they got up so that we could go and tear open all those presents that my mother had so meticulously wrapped. All her hard work was destroyed in a five-minute frenzy of tearing up paper. You know, I think about the gifts, you know, that I got when I was a kid. And I got some really good gifts. I remember getting a $6 million man mission control center. Which makes me feel old because that sounds cheap now, doesn't it? Six million dollars, not that big a deal. Um, you know, I think about the leather coat I got when I was a teenager, which was all I wanted because I was a rebel without a cause, and I thought that was the greatest thing. I bet some of the kids here have already gotten some great Christmas presents, haven't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you have. That's right. But what's the greatest Christmas present you could ever get? Now, I bet if we went around the room, we'd come up with a lot of different answers because we all like different things. But you know, when we think about what this day of celebration is all about, it's a no-brainer. Because the greatest Christmas gift that's ever been given was when God gave us his son to come and be one of us so that he could save us from our sins. So today, we're going to look at the things that made his coming so great. We're going to think about his the Father's planning and execution in sending His Son. And we're going to see that it was perfect and wondrous. God is so good to us. And He has done such a marvelous thing in sending His Son. And we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper as we do this. A special gift that Jesus gave us to remind us of what He has done for us. And I pray that as we do so, it will change our outlook on the celebration of Christmas. What a wonderful thing that we could get together on Christmas Day and remember the great gift that God has given to us and what it means for our lives today. Christmas is more than just a day of extravagant consumerism. It's one of wholehearted worship 
and joy. So let's enjoy him today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather together on this special day where we remember the birth of your son, Lord, we are reminded that you are a good God. Lord, and you are so good to us. We thank you for the gift of your son. Lord, we pray that as we worship you today, Lord, that you would be born into our hearts afresh and anew. Lord, that our joy would fill to overflowing, that, Lord, we would leave this place with a desire to go and tell others about you. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to see the glory of your birth, of your life, of your death, and of your resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh. Uh-huh. 
Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Debbie. Randy. My wife loves to hear Oh Holy Night, and Greg, she still talks about when you sang during the Christmas program when you were her middle school principal. <laughs> you know, just a couple years ago. Uh, so I know she enjoyed that, um, like we all did. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. All right, as Craig said, we're talking about the coming of our Savior being the, the greatest Christmas gift, and just talking about what goes into a, a great Christmas gift, period. Um, any great Christmas gift. And when I think about giving a, a great gift, the first thing that I think about is the strategy that goes into it, the, the plan. The first step in being able to give a great gift is having a great strategy. A good strategy means that something is well thought out and not just last minute. Now, I know that, that I've done this, and I'm sure many of you have, have gone and gotten something last minute. Uh, maybe you, you forgot about or maybe something just caught your eye, and things worked out great, right? That's happened before. But that's not how it generally works out. Generally, you need to have a strategy. You need to have a plan. And that shows that, that more effort and thought was put into it. it. It shows more about the intent of the giver and wanting to give something special to the recipient. It shows the recipient that, that more was put into it, um, more planning and thought and effort uh, to be able to give that, that special gift. You know, and I, I think about a strategy for giving a good gift. And I think about a few years ago, back in December of, of 2016, my wife and I wrapped a, a really big box for our kids. And we had them open it together. We told them it, it was a gift for both of them. And inside of this big box was a banner we had made. It was, it was all rolled up. They had to take it out and unroll it. It stretched almost all the way across the living room. And on this banner, it said in really big letters in my most beautiful handwriting, um, I can write nicely if I need to. It said, we're going to Germany. Now, you know, that, that doesn't mean much to, to most of you, but they, they were wide-eyed and they were looking and they were wondering. And because Andrew knows me, he, he asked, does this mean like now, or is this like, like sometime way out eventually we'll go? You know, because, you know, just because I say I'm doing something, I might mean in a few years. Um, but he, he said, does this mean like now? Like, like we're really going? I said, we're going the day after tomorrow. We're going on December 27th. We'll be flying out that morning. And so then they just lose it. They start screaming and jumping up and down. See, my... Uh, brother-in-law, his family, they were living in Frankfurt at the time, and they live in different areas um, of the world because of his, his job uh, for a few years at a time. And whenever they're around visiting, he'll say, y'all need to come visit us wherever they're at. Come visit us in Israel. Come visit us in Turkey. Come visit us in Bulgaria. Come visit us in Germany. So we, we'd always hear those kinds of things, and his kids are about the same age as my kids, and they, they play really well together. They get along great. They just don't get to spend a lot of time together. And so this was really exciting for my kids to think that now we were actually going to go to one of these faraway places, and they would be able to see their cousins and, and be able to play and have a great time. And so part of my strategy in that, because that, that trip doesn't just happen, Part of my strategy was that, that months earlier, whenever something was on on the Travel Channel on Germany, we were watching it. Hey, look, this is, this is near where Dustin's family is. This is you know, kind of the things that they'll see over there. And like showing pictures of the, the Neuschwanstein Castle, you know, the, the one that the Disney Cinderella Castle was modeled after. You know, look at this. This is in Germany near where they're at. So cool. And, you know, looking at things on Food Network because I've got to see what I'm going to eat and where I'm going to eat whenever I go anywhere. You know, look at these kinds of things that they got over there. And pretty soon I, I would start to hear comments from my kids. That's so cool. I wish we could go. Can we ever go somewhere like that? I had them hooked. I had them. Had them. 
But then you got the, the logistics, right? We also had to, to get the plane tickets well in advance. We had to uh, stop by the post office and get everything filled out and sent off for passports for the kids. You know, and they wanted to know, why do we need passports? Well, Samantha and I had just been to Haiti earlier that year. And so we told them, well, you know, if we want to go on another trip, we want you guys to be prepared in case we want to take you with us. Could we really go somewhere? I don't know. We want to do this just in case. So we had passports taken care of and out of the way. And, of course, you know, like lining up a rental car and, and looking at all the different laws that they had in Germany. Andrew was in a booster seat here. He had to, to be in a five-point harness in a car seat there. Um, it, it, was, it was difficult. So I had to rent two car seats with a rental car as well. But we had to, to plan out all of that. It took a lot of, lot of strategy. But it, it paid off so dramatically in their reaction that Christmas morning. They were so incredibly excited about that trip. And they had never been on a plane before either. So that was really cool for your first flight to be on one of the, the huge planes going across the ocean. So it, it was just awesome to see the way that that, that plan worked out and their excitement. And it brought me so much joy knowing how much, how much work, how much effort, how much planning, how much strategy I had put in, into that and, and just seeing it on their faces and in their reaction that morning. But we think about God's strategy. God's strategy in giving a very special, very meaningful Christmas gift, the greatest gift of all. He had a strategy for that Christmas gift from the beginning of time, from before we can ever imagine or fathom. But we first get a glimpse of his plan, of his strategy in the Garden of Eden, right after the fall. In Genesis 3.15, it says, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. God's Christmas gift, Jesus, is the offspring of the woman referenced here in Genesis 3.15. And he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. It's pointing to Jesus' defeat of Satan through his work on the cross. This was all part of God's big strategy, God's big plan from the beginning. It was not a backup plan because of how people treated Jesus when he was here on the earth. It, it wasn't something that occurred because of a change. No, this was God's plan from the beginning for his perfect gift for all of humanity. Further, in the incarnation of Jesus, we see the fulfillment of God's plan, God's promise to Abraham, in Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3, it says, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. He says, all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That blessing was and is Jesus. He will be a blessing to all people as the Son of God taking on flesh, coming to this earth. And we're reminded of this promise in Mary's song of praise in Luke 1, 54 and 55. She said, he has helped his servant Israel remembering, remembering his mercy to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he spoke to our ancestors. Mary recognized that this was the fulfillment of the promise that God had made to Abraham. This was the working out of God's strategy, of God's plan for his Christmas gift. He had not forgotten his promise. He stayed true to his strategy. Pastor and author Tim Keller said, Christmas means that God is working out his purposes. He will fulfill his promises, as the hymn goes, for his mercies I endure, ever faithful, ever sure. So Christmas means that though the meals of God grind slowly, they grind ex exceedingly fine. God may seem to have forgotten, 
But right now he is in the process of arranging all that will fulfill his great promises. Read the Bible and see the promises to those who believe. That was what Tim Keller said about God's plan, about God's strategy. And then when we look at Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, it says, When the time came to completion, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. When the time came to completion. Older translations read, In the fullness of time. The New Living Translation says, When the right time came. When the right time came. But don't misunderstand, I think, the way it sounds when the right time came. Maybe God was just waiting and watching, and when things finally got bad enough, He said, oh, I'll send Jesus now. No. No, God was sovereignly working, putting everything in place for that right time to come about. He wasn't just waiting for time. He had an appointed time already strategized, already planned, already worked out. This was the perfect time for His Son to take on flesh, to come to this earth. And in, in the fullness of time, at just the right time, after the patriarchs had, had set everything up with God's people, after the great kingdoms of David and Solomon, after all the strife of the divided kingdom and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and the exile to Babylon and the people being taken away from their homeland, after all the messages of the prophets, followed by 400 years of silence, and made it just the right time theologically. After the Romans had helped to spread an atmosphere of paganism and idolatry and mythology and emperor worship throughout the land, so that non-Jews were open and searching, knowing that there had to be something more, something genuine, something transcendent and yet intimate. The unknown God that Paul talked to them about in Acts chapter 17, it was just the right time, religiously. After the empire of Alexander the Great to spread the Greek language throughout the region <clears throat> and most of the known world so that communication could easily take place between different people groups, it was just the right time culturally. After the Romans had ushered in the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, so that a more sophisticated infrastructure could be put into place, allowing travel and commerce to flourish, making it easier than ever in history before for people to move back and forth, for ideas to be transferred, for information to be sent from one place to another, like the good news of the gospel moving throughout the world. It was just the right time politically and logistically. God did not just throw together a last-minute gift. He had a strategy. He had a plan for just the right time. A perfect plan with precision and thought and care. The perfect strategy at the perfect time for the perfect gift. So this time I want us to, to pray and to thank God for His strategy, for His plan. As I mentioned earlier, seeing someone work out a, a plan and a strategy in the gift they give it gives glory to the giver to see how much care they have taken for that gift. It helps us see how much God cares for us in the perfect gift of His Son. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we thank You for Your your strategy, your plan, your care that you have taken. Lord, in sending your Son at just the right time, the perfect gift at the perfect time, the full divinity of God taking on human flesh to come to us, Lord, we are so blessed, and we praise you, and we thank you. God, that you would take such care.
God, that you would work out such perfect precision. So, God, we, we thank you this morning. We praise you this morning for the Christmas gift of your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. We stand and join us. Come the long really great present not only requires strategy, it requires sacrifice. You know, I think about what Eric just told the story he just told about the trip to Germany. That required a great deal of sacrifice. Time, money. You know, when I was growing up, I knew my mom and dad didn't have much money. So whenever they gave me something that I knew was more than they could afford, I really, really appreciated it. It meant a lot to me. Because I'm sure there were many times that they gave me Something I wanted uh, by having to give up something that they needed. You know, in the case of giving his son, our Heavenly Father gave up what was most precious to him so that we could receive something that we desperately needed even though we didn't realize it. You know, the concept of the need for sacrifice goes back to the Garden of Eden, just like Eric was talking about. After Adam and Eve sinned, God made them clothing out of animal skins. And that clothing of animal skins covered their nakedness. That was necessary because of their sin that came at the cost of those animal lives. But you know, those skin coverings for their nakedness did not ultimately cover their sin. It was not enough. You know, long before it became clear that God would send His only Son to provide the covering for our sins, God taught Abraham about the pain involved in making such a sacrifice when He called Abraham to sacrifice His son Isaac in Genesis 22. It's one of my favorite stories uh, in the Bible. You know, God tells Abraham to take his son, his only son, and sacrifice him. 
told him to go to Mount Moriah, told him to take his son in the wood up for the sacrifice onto the mountain. You know, the interesting thing about that story is Abraham never questioned God's call to sacrifice his son. He was perfectly obedient. And you know, we like to think of Isaac as being just a little toddler who couldn't do anything, but he carried the wood up, so he was, a, he was, he was grown. He was, he was probably a teenager by that point. And he was old enough to recognize that something was wrong, right? He knew that there was something strange about what was going on. Something was missing as they were on the way up for the sacrifice. And he asked his father, where's the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham's reply to him shows such great faith. He said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. God will provide. He didn't know when, and he didn't know how, but he knew that he would. And so the old man tied up his son. He placed him on, on the altar. He lifted the knife up into the air. He was ready to obey God no matter what the consequences were. And you know why? Because Hebrews eleven nineteen says, he considered God to be able even to raise someone from the dead. Therefore, he received him back, figuratively speaking. In other words, Abraham trusted God so implicitly that he was ready to sacrifice Isaac, knowing that God would bring him back. Because God had promised him that all of the blessings that Eric read about earlier in Genesis 12 were coming through that boy. He knew that. And he knew that God would not let that child die. But God wasn't going to let it go that far. An angel told him to stop and said, for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your only son from me. And he provided a ram caught in a thicket for the sacrifice. And that's a beautiful story. But you know, there would come a time when there would be no ram caught in a thicket to save the beloved son. John 3.16 is probably the most well-known verse in the Bible, but sometimes I think we miss out on the gift-giving aspect of it because it's become so familiar to us. It says, yeah, and we're also used to hearing in the old translation, for God so loved the world. I want you to understand something. That's not a good translation. It's not about the amount of God's love. God's love is never greater or lesser. God's love is absolute. Our modern translations do it better. For God loved the world in this way. God loved the world in this way. In other words, God showed his love through a particular action. And what was that action? <clears throat> that action was that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God showed his love in the most perfect way. By giving his son's life. What greater display of love could there possibly be for us to show us how he cares for us? Our Heavenly Father was willing to allow his son to come to this earth and be our sacrifice so that we could live because there was no other way that we could be saved. And he was willing to part with what was most precious to him to give us what we so desperately needed. Abraham got a taste of what that was like, but it wasn't even close to what the father went through. You see, he didn't just have a close relationship with the son. He was one with the son. He had been one with the son for all eternity, and there was nothing that had ever separated them. And yet he gave that up for imperfect, sinful people like us. As we prepare to take the bread today, I want to take a moment to meditate on Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 through 28. It says there, For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with hands, only a model of the true one, but into heaven itself, so that we might now appear, so that he might now appear in the presence of God for us. He did not do this to offer himself many times, as the high priest enters the sanctuary yearly with the blood of another. Otherwise, he would have had to suffer many times since the foundation of the world. 
But now he's appeared one time at the end of the ages for the removal of sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for people to die once, and after this judgment, so also Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Jesus came from heaven to earth to offer himself as a sacrifice that would be fit for the heavenly sanctuary, something no other sacrifice could ever do on this earth. And because his sacrifice was accepted by the Father, when he comes back to earth a second time, it will be for our final salvation. To take us home, to be with him and the Father forever. The Father sent his Son and offered him as our sacrifice, and the Son willingly gave his life to save us. What a high cost was paid by God for our salvation. That's why we celebrate the Lord's Supper. That's why we remember his sacrifice for us. As we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper today, I want you to understand that the Lord's Supper is for uh, baptized believers, those who have made a public profession of faith. If you haven't done that, that's okay. I hope that you will sit here and that you will learn about who Christ is through what we are doing. However, if you are a baptized believer who has made a public profession of faith, I invite you to join us as we partake of the bread that represents the body of our Lord. But before we do that, we want to take a few moments and we want to let God search our hearts. You know, the Bible tells us that if we do not confess our sins when we take of the Lord's Supper, supper, that We treat his sacrifice in an unworthy manner. And it makes us guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. You see, sin separates us from fellowship with God. Even those of us who are believers, even those of us who have been saved, we still collect sin in our lives every day. That's why Jesus told his disciples they needed to have their feet washed. He said, you don't need to have your whole body washed. He said, but you pick up the dirt and the grime of the world every day that you walk in it. And we need that regular cleansing. And so we want to take a few moments today to let the Lord search our hearts, to let him convict us of sin, so that we can confess that sin to, uh, to him and ask for him to cleanse us, so that we can take the Lord's Supper with pure hearts. So let's take a few minutes for that. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. See if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, that is our prayer today. As we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper, as we remember the great sacrifice that you made for our sin, Lord, we understand that we cannot harbor sin in our hearts And honor you. Certainly not honor this celebration where we remember the price that you paid because of that sin. So Lord, we confess to you today, Lord, that each of us has sin in us. But we thank you that forgiveness is free and abundant in Christ. And so, Lord, we lay our sin at the foot of your cross. 
pray that you would cover it with your blood so that we may rejoice in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you ask the blessing on us, prayer?
You know, another essential element of a, a great gift is the element of surprise. I love to surprise people. I also love to scare people. That kind of goes hand in hand, right? Surprise people when they, they don't know it and don't expect it. Um, but surprise is often achieved by doing or, or giving something that is unexpected or that drastically exceeds expectations. When I, I think about that, I think about the, uh, the, the first Christmas. Uh, my wife is giving me a look now. Um, she told me not to use her in any illustrations, but she's all over them. Um, our, our first Christmas after we started dating, um, we had been dating seven weeks, seven weeks exactly, I actually looked at it the other day, to, uh, to Christmas Eve, which is when we exchanged gifts uh, my family would go over to our grandparents' house on Christmas Eve, and so she was with me there. And then after everything kind of settled down, we went outside to get away from everybody, went to, to my car to exchange gifts, and I got her gift out. And, I mean, I, I wanted it to be a nice gift, but I, I didn't think it was all that necessarily. But I, I got her a, a teddy bear. And I got her a gold chain because everybody had a gold chain in high school and she had said she wanted one. And I, I got her a gold chain and a little gold pendant that said, I love you on it. And, oh, thank you. <laughs> no, right? But she, she looked at me and she looked at the, the gift and she just kind of stood silent and it got kind of awkward and I'm like, did I do something wrong? And she just looked at me. She wouldn't answer me. I said, is this okay? Should I have done something differently? And her eyes started to water up a little bit. 
and she just hugged me. And I'm still thinking, am I in trouble or is this good? <laughs> and she stops hugging me and, and she looks at me. I said, was that okay? She still didn't say anything. And so she said, let's go back inside. So we went back inside and I'm still wondering, am I in trouble? And, and finally, thankfully, the next day she was able to, to speak coherently and she told me, yes, I had done very well. I, the, the gift was great. It was just that she wasn't expecting to get something uh, that nice on our, our first Christmas together. And I said, so that's a good thing. And she said, yes, yes, it's, it's a very good thing. So I, I had exceeded her expectations. And so it was a, a big surprise. It was a great Christmas gift. Um, and sometimes we can achieve surprise by doing the unexpected. I mean, a few years after we were married and we decided we weren't going to give gifts anymore, I got her a gift anyway, and she was mad at me when she saw she had a present under the tree. But I told her, I said, it's, it's nothing big or, or fancy or whatever. She had said a few months earlier that she would iron more of my shirts if she had a decent iron. <laughs> I got her an iron. <laughs> she, it was unexpected. She was more angry after she found out what the gift was than when she saw I had gotten her a gift. For quite a while, I might add. <laughs> so surprise can be achieved both ways. It, it can be unexpected and that can be good or bad or it can be through exceeding expectations when God gave his his greatest gift he did both what was unexpected and what exceeded expectations it was surprised to its fullest extent we see that in the nativity account in Luke chapter 2 I'm going to read from Luke 2 verses 8 through 20 it says, in the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. After seeing them, they reported the message they were told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. You know, and God had told the people what He was going to do through, through so many prophecies before. But it's easy to understand those prophecies for us looking back. For them, they kind of gave them hints of what was going to happen. But the way God fulfilled those prophecies, the way He fulfilled His plan was truly unexpected. The King of all creation, the Lord of all the universe, the promised Messiah had come. But He had come as a helpless baby. Put in a feeding trough in a stable. He had come, and who were the first ones to receive the news? The lowly shepherds who were out in their fields with the livestock. This was truly unexpected. They were the dregs of society. And yet they, they're the ones who get this news first. 
At first we see them as fearful, and then they're joyful, and then they're obedient, and they go, and they see the Messiah, and then they become the first evangelist, going and telling everyone this good news of the newborn Messiah that they had seen. That they had seen this newborn Messiah, the King, as a helpless baby. But they would not dare look down on this child in a a feeding trough. They beheld the infant Savior with adoration and worship. It was truly unexpected the way God worked out His plan, His strategy, His promise. Martin Luther said, Christianity does not begin at the top as all other religions do. It begins at the bottom. You must run directly to the manger in the mother's womb. Embrace this infant and virgin's child in your arms and look at him. Born, being nursed, growing up, going about in human society, teaching, dying, rising again, ascending above the heavens, and having authority over all things. That's the unexpected. And then when we look at Matthew's account of the nativity, we see in verse 23... It says, see, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. God with us. You know, and and I could see them understanding this prophecy. It, It was coming from Isaiah when Matthew was telling it here. Seeing this prophecy and thinking, yes, God will be with us. We will we will feel his presence. We will know His Spirit. But God goes so far beyond that. He exceeds expectations. God with us. They didn't understand that to mean God as one of us. God with us in the person of Jesus. He goes beyond expectations. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Above and beyond all that we ask or think. When Paul wrote that, he's making up words. He, he's adding like prefixes on the words and, and creating words that had not ever existed in the Greek before that because of the way he's trying to communicate something so unbelievable. Above and beyond all we can ask or think. God exceeds expectations. Jesus is God with us. Fully God and yet fully man. Talk about a surprise. Talk about a surprise. Colossians 1.19 says, For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him. God with us. God in human form. God in taking on flesh as a helpless babe. Theologian J.I. Packer said, God became man. The divine son became a Jew. The Almighty appeared on earth as a helpless human baby, unable to do more than lie and stare and wriggle and make noises, needing to be fed and changed and taught, to talk like any other child. The babyhood of the Son of God was a reality. The more you think about it, the more staggering it gets. Nothing in fiction is so fantastic as the truth of the Incarnation. We see more of this in in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. It says, Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity, And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's focus on verses 6 and 7 there. Who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. He became a man. 
One commentator said that Paul was stressing that Christ, who had all the privileges that were rightly his as king of the universe, gave them up to become an ordinary Jewish baby bound for the cross. Dorothy Sayers, who's a British essayist and novelist, she said the incarnation means that for whatever reason God chose to let us fall, to suffer, to be subject to sorrows and death, and he has nonetheless had the honesty and the courage to take his own medicine. He can exact nothing from man that he has not exacted from himself. He himself has gone through the whole of human experience, from the trivial irritations of family life and the cramping restrictions of hard work and lack of money to the worst horrors of pain and humiliation, defeat, despair, and death. He was born in poverty and suffered infinite pain, all for us. And he thought it well worth his while in doing so. It was well worth his while. This is the greatest gift. This is God doing the unexpected and going beyond expectations. So much so that God took on flesh. God took on a body as a man with blood coursing through his veins. Blood that he shed on the cross. Something we remember today as we take the Lord's Supper. His all-sufficient sacrifice. Truly a surprise that we could not expect, and yet one that we could not live without. Let's pray. Father God, God Almighty, I, I thank you that you are not bound by our expectations. That you are willing to do what is completely unexpected. That you are willing to go so far beyond expectations. And not just for the sake of surprise, though it is a surprise. God, because it is what had to happen for our sin to be atoned for, for us to be made right with you, for you to receive all glory and honor and praise, to appease your wrath, to satisfy your justice, to show the outpouring of your love. God, we thank you for the surprise of the greatest gift. God, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Now I'm going to ask our deacons to stand for the cup. Paul, would you please bless the cup? Sure. <clears throat> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, when we think about the blood, you know what it means for us. You know what it means that it is the forgiveness of our sins, removing our sins from us completely and entirely. But when we think about what that means, Lord, we know that one day everyone is going to stand before the judgment seat. And for those, Lord, that stand there in filthy rags and tremble in fear for what is about to happen. But for those, Lord, who have accepted that blood through faith, Lord, we will not be there in trembling. We will be there in white robes. We will be there, Lord, and you will look upon us not with eyes of wrath at our sin and rebellion, but rather you will look on us through the eyes of Jesus, who loved us so much Father, for the blood. Thank you for the good.
eternal life that it means for us. And we'll just praise you, Lord, and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Scripture says, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. Please stand and join us with good Christian men and join us. Coming of our Savior was the greatest gift of all because of the strategy God employed, because of the significant cost of his sacrifice and the unexpected surprise that it brings that exceeds all of our expectations. But there's one last thing. The gift of our Savior is also great because of the satisfaction he provides. You remember when you were a kid and you got that great gift and you just played with it, and you played with it, and you played with it for, you know, all day on Christmas Day, maybe even the week after, maybe even for a month. And then it got old, right? And then it went in the closet, or went in the toy box. Eventually it ended up at a yard sale, right? What seemed to be so satisfying wasn't all that satisfying anymore. Well, I want you to understand something. The gift of our Savior not only brings great excitement when we receive Him, but our joy only grows greater as the years go by. As we develop that relationship with Him and we realize the full benefit of what He has done for us, Jesus is truly the gift that keeps on giving. You know, John 1 tells us, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed His glory the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from His fullness. I love that phrase, grace upon grace. You see, we are so desperately in need of more and more grace as the days and years go by. That's the wonderful thing is that we get to experience more of it every day because our need for it never goes away. I want you to know something. If you're struggling to feel His presence today, if the joy of your salvation has faded with time, I want to encourage you with these words from John chapter 15, verses 9 through 11. Jesus said, There as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. I want you to think about that for a minute. Jesus loves us the same way the Father loves him. And that's a perfect and eternal love that never changes. He never loves you any more. He never loves you any less, no matter what you do. But... You can miss out on the joy of your relationship with him by not remaining in his love. You see, we let a lot of other things get in the way of our relationship with God, kind of the way we do with people, right? 
we let things get in the way of our earthly relationships, but even more so, we let things get in the way of our heavenly relationship. We put other things ahead of him. We chase after things that he has told us to stay away from, and it ends up hindering our relationship with him. But I want you to understand, he offers grace upon grace. If we will return to him, if we will obey his commands and remain in his love, he promises that his joy will be in us and our joy will be complete. That's his invitation to you today. I hope that you will accept his invitation and that you would find your complete satisfaction in him and him alone because there's nothing in this world that can ever give you what he can. And there's only one thing that ultimately satisfies, and that is Him. Christmas is the perfect time to renew your relationship with the Lord as we remember the great gift He gave us by coming to this earth to be born just like one of us for the sole purpose of dying on a cross to save us. So I ask you, are you satisfied in Him today? Are you getting the full benefit of your salvation, of your relationship with Him? I invite you to commit to following him as Lord and being obedient to his call on your life and discover how fulfilling your life can be when it is founded on him and him alone. And when your joy is full, let it overflow onto others. We're going to close by singing Go Tell It on the Mountain today. And I, I, I hope that we will leave this place with a song in our hearts and the gospel on our lips to tell everyone that a Savior has been born and even better, wants to be born in their hearts today. So let's sing. Please stand and join us. Go to got no announcements for you. Right? We've got no activities this evening. We've got none Wednesday night. I hope that you have a very Merry Christmas and enjoy time with family and friends this week. God is good. All the time. All the time. All the time. Have a blessed day.